Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. Welcome to the Moth Podcast. I'm Larry Rosen, your host for this episode. In 2022, we've been marking 25 years of the Moth by looking back at our history. This episode, we're going all the way to 1999, the year we began our community engagement program. We started the program as a way of engaging with storytellers who might not otherwise have found their way to us. Today, the program partners with local groups, cultural institutions, and nonprofits to host workshops that inspire confidence and self-reflection and deepen connections within and between communities. To celebrate the program, we're playing two stories that came out of community workshops. And stick around after the stories to hear a little more on what the program is all about. First up is Marie Hershkowitz. Marie participated in a workshop we conducted in partnership with the Brooklyn Public Library in 2014. She went on to share her story in a New York City community showcase that same year. Here's Marie, live at the moment. It's the summer of 1965, the one right before junior high school. My parents are hard workers. That's what they did. They worked. Vacation was not a word in our family dictionary. So here I am, bored to death, just wishing for school to start already so I'd have something to do. So then one day I turn on the television set and I find the New York Mets. Now I don't know much about baseball at that point, but I decided I'd have nothing else better to do, so I might as well watch. So I watched the game, and I realized that this is simple. I can follow this. There's nine players, nine innings. They come up in the same order all of the time, and with my Mets, it's three up, three down. Very easy. I caught on quick. I caught on quick. And by the end of the game, I understood baseball. I knew all the players' names, and I was hooked. So now my sister and I start watching all the televised games, and my parents actually managed to take us to a couple of games over that summer of 65. By the summer of 66, my sister and I are taking the hour and a half long trek out to Shea Stadium on the trains by ourselves. And we're going as many, to as many games as my father could get tickets to, not realizing that it's easy to get tickets because the Mets are so lousy, nobody else wants to watch them play. <laughs> So in the meantime, we don't care if they win or they lose. We don't care how good or bad they are. We don't even know that they're terrible. But we're Mets fans, and we're happy. And then the season ends, and we're sad. And it takes until 1967, when I'm there with my parents watching the World Series, that I realize if my team was good, if they could actually get into first place, win the National League, my season wouldn't have to end, because they could go to the World Series. So I asked my dad, when the Mets get into the World Series, will you take us? And he says, sure. Well, then 68 comes, we go to lots more games. We're happy campers. And 68 World Series comes along, and of course the Mets are not in it. And we ask our dad, when the Mets get into the World Series, will you take us? And he says, sure. And of course, my father knows, the Mets finished last in 1968. And no one in the baseball world, or in fact anybody in their right mind, would ever expect that he was going to have to make do on a promise like this anytime soon, if ever. <laughs> well now, if you're a Mets fan of a certain age, you know what happened in 1969. Straight from the cellar, ninth place, last place, nine out of nine, they shot right up to first place in 1969 and actually won the National League pennant and went into the World Series against the hard-hitting Baltimore Orioles. So here we are, they're back from Baltimore, having won, won and lost one, so they're even, even coming into New York to Shea Stadium for games three, four, and five on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, even won one. So Monday, I don't see any Mets tickets, so I, I'm hearing on the radio that they're hard to get, they're costing hundreds of dollars, it's gonna be record-breaking crowd, standing room only, and I'm, Worried, so I asked Dad, are we going to the World Series? And he says, don't worry about it. So Tuesday comes, Tuesday goes, 
we don't go to the game, but the Mets managed to win. So now they're going into Wednesday to game three, no, to game four, winning, leading two games to one. So of course that night we're asking dad, are we going to the World Series? And he says, don't worry about it. Well, now I'm worried because, you know, there's only two games left here in New York. And even if they win, and they're either going to win them both and they're going to win it here at home or they're going to go back to Baltimore and play the last two. But either way, there's only two games for me to watch, for me to get a chance to go and share this with them. So anyway, Wednesday comes. We again watch them win on TV. They managed to win without us. And Wednesday night, I'm asked, there I am asking dad again like a broken record. Are we going to the World Series? And he says, don't worry about it. So here it is, Thursday afternoon, the day when they can win it all. And we're home. So we're getting ready. I'm resigned now to watch this game on TV. And all of a sudden, my mother comes into the kitchen with two tickets in her hand, this hand and the car keys in the other. So now I am overjoyed and panic-stricken. So I look at the clock. And I see, there's no way, even if my mother drives us to the train, there's no way that we are going to make it to this game for the start of the game. So the next thing I know, we're in the car. And before I realize it, we're not going in the direction of the train. We're going the opposite way. And I'm understanding that my mother, this woman, who has never driven out of the neighborhood, <laughs> intends to take us to the ballpark. <laughs> well, I don't know how we got there, but it was in record time. And my very next memory is of my mother arguing with the parking lot attendant because they want her to pay the fee and she's refusing to pay. And this is going back and forth. And in the meantime, I'm getting more and more nervous and all the cars behind me would be perfectly happy to pay their fee and get into this ballpark in time to watch this great game of the century. And all, and so, the, so they're honking their horns. And this is getting the attention now of a police officer. So he comes on over and he wants to know, what's the holdup? The attendant tells him, this, t this woman won't pay. So he says, lady, you better have a good reason. So she says, there's three of us, only two tickets. I'm not staying, I'm just dropping them off. He goes, lady, you're crazy. What are you, nuts? I'd never let my kids go when I had the chance to go to a game like this. But he felt so sorry for her and so impressed that she was doing this for her, us that he waved her on in for free and even told her how to get back on the parkway. <laughs> so she, she rushes us to the nearest gate we run in, we, we have to stop for the national anthem, but we're this close, we're this close to our seats, and we actually manage to slip on in there as the first pitch is being thrown. Well, the rest is history. You all know what happened. The Mets won the World Series, they became world champs, and I was there. Best sports moment ever for me. Still to this day, all these years later, best moment ever. So now here I am at the end of the game. I'm on the seven train, coming home with all these jubilant Met fans screaming and yelling. I'm holding on it's for dear life, and I'm clutching my souvenir right field grass close to my heart. And I'm thinking, how on earth did my father come up with these tickets? And what on earth did my mother think? And when did she get these tickets? And what was she thinking that she couldn't go? And what gave her the strength to think that she could drive us there, right? So I'm sitting now, I'm a, I'm a smart kid. I know what parents is, are all about. I know they're supposed to keep you safe. They're supposed to provide you the basics. They're supposed to teach you right from wrong and maybe give you a little encouragement now and then. But when I'm standing there, it occurs to me that it, parenting is more than that. It's about keeping promises and about self-sacrifice. And I'm thinking to myself right then and there that if I'm ever blessed to have children of my own, that I want to be the kind of parent that my parents were that day. Yeah, I'm a Mets fan and I believe, but that day was the first time that I actually believed that every child deserves at least one day of perfect parenting. That was Marie Hershkowitz. 
A devoted Mets fan for 57 years, Marie is still waiting for that elusive third World Series championship. She and her family of long-suffering Mets fans thought for sure this was the year, and 2022 was a great season while it lasted. Marie says, it's never been easy being a Mets fan, but it's always been fun. You gotta love the Mets for all the joy the team has brought to my family over the years. Our next story is from David Gaskin. We met David in a workshop we conducted with Second Chance Studios, a nonprofit digital media company that trains and employs formerly incarcerated individuals. David went on to share his story at the 2022 Mothball in New York. Here's David. Um, it was September 10th, 2009, and I was located in Governor Correctional Facility. Governor Correctional Facility is a medium classified correctional facility and I was at the tail end of serving nine years and eight months from an 11-year bid. Bid is a terminology that we utilize to disturb, uh, describe the length of a sentence. I was standing inside my cube looking around and I had a thought, Dave, you need to get rid of some of this crap. And the crap that I thought about getting rid of was my personal belongings that I had accumulated over the years. And uh, the reason why I was thinking about getting rid of it was because I was scheduled to be released the very next day. Upon having this thought, I looked around the dorm and I caught the eyes of my comrades and I motioned them over to my cube with the nod of my head like, come over here. And uh, they came over and once they got to the cube, I just told them, go in there and take whatever you want. My comrade June walked in first and he decided to take some of the clothes. He took some sweatsuits and some shirts that we call visiting room shirts. It allowed us to look cool while he was out there on the visiting room. Animal was the next one inside the cube. He went straight for my books, about two or three reading books, and the rest were BBWs and blacktails that he continued to grab. <laughs> and Oz, who's the greedy one out of the whole crew, went directly for my locker. He went right in. He started digging in the non-perishable items, the snacks, the canned goods, even the little packs of sugar he decided to take. <laughs> right there in that moment, I was feeling great. Yeah, I'm about to be released the next day and I'm doing something great for my guys. And that feeling was snatched away. I began to feel a pain in my chest. It happened so fast, it was sharp. And just as fast as it happens, it was just as fast as it left. So I continued on with my day, and I did something that usually uh, what young black men would do in that moment when they encountered a feeling that they do not know. I disregarded it. I went about my day as a gym worker to my mandatory program, and when that was over, I returned back to the dorm. When I returned back to the dorm and I walked in, I noticed the usual. Some people standing around talking, some sitting down watching TV, others playing card games, chess or checkers. But then I noticed the unusual. I noticed Oz, June, and Animal in the far back of the TV room, standing in what appears to be a round circle meeting. To the untrained eye, they might have just been standing there, but to my eye, they was having a meeting, and this meeting was pretty intense. I immediately had two thoughts. The first, the fuck is going on over there? <laughs> and the second, why wasn't I invited? <laughs> so, I decided to make my way over to this circle to be fake nosy, right? And that's being nosy, but first you have to fake it first, right? So I slides over and I start moseying around so I get a little closer. And as I get closer, I say to June, what's going on over here? And he turns around very fast and says, we're trying to figure out what to make you for your last meal today. And he goes to turn back around and he snaps back real fast and he says, and I don't know why we're thinking about making you anything because your ass going home tomorrow. Shockingly, I step back, I look at eyes and animal. They begin to chuckle. I turn back and I look at June. And I says, sounds like you hating, bro. And me and June stare at each other for a second. And then we both break out into our own little laugh, mixed with a handshake and a bro hug. They decided to make some of my favorite items that night, which is honey barbecue chicken, baked macaroni and cheese, some yams, and coconut rice. Now, 
animal who is from a Caribbean descent, actually Jamaican, made this coconut rice. And this coconut rice was everything. I mean, 10 plus years I've been out here in the world and I have yet to find anybody, any place, any restaurant who can make coconut rice like animal. I mean, it was fire, right? So after we made this food, we all sat there and began to break bread together, share some stories, reminisce of the time that we had spent together. And I remember in that moment feeling very appreciative, very grateful, like, look at my guys. They done communicated, took their time out, put together this meal for me. And in that moment, those feelings and no emotions was ripped away once again by that pain in my chest. But this time, it was much more intense. I felt like I had to coach myself to breathe. As we were sitting there having conversations, I was hoping nobody noticed. And then a count was called. And I alleviated that feeling. After the count was called, I returned back into my queue and uh, I laid on my bed. And I put my hands behind my head with my fingers interlocked like this. And I crossed my legs. And I began to look out of the window and zone out. And as I zoned out, I noticed that feet shuffling and lockers opening and closing begin to die down. Staring out the window, I began to have these thoughts, right? And my thoughts was like, I wonder how many people slept in this bed that I'm sleeping in right now. I wonder how many people slept in this bed who was supposed to be scheduled for release the next day. And of course, I thought about those that would never be released. Staring out of the window, I noticed that the sky went from being dark black to a dark gray. And that dark gray turned into a light gray. And those feet shuffling and lockers doors opening and closing that had died down, they began to pick back up. Those thoughts were broken by the sound of a telephone ringing. Ring, 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 ring. The receiver was snatched up, but nothing was said on my end. Only thing I could hear was a loud bang when it slammed, boom. And then I heard something I've been waiting to hear for a long time. Gaskin, which is my last name. My moment had come, and I was about to be released, y'all. As I began to walk through the little small corridor, who else is there waiting for me? June, eyes an animal. Soon as I walk through the door, here go June, throwing his best combination of air punches, some jabs mixed with some body shots. I find myself blatantly blocking them, but none got in. Eyes is standing behind him, he's screaming, yeah, yeah. And uh, animal who's about six foot four, 230 plus pounds, casually walked up to me put his arm around my neck, his big arm, and what I thought was just gonna be a humble hug, his arm began to get tighter and tighter and tighter around my neck. I found myself hitting him with a little jab, like, come on, bro, loosen that up some. <laughs> and right there in that moment, I was attacked again by that same underlying feelings and emotions that I was having before. But this time, it was very intense. I felt like somebody was squeezing on my esophagus and my heart at the same time. I had to coach myself to breathe. I felt like I was getting a little dizzy. I don't know if I was bugging out or if animal arm was just that tight around my neck, right? So I hit him again with a little elbow, like, nah, bro, you gotta get up off me. We said our uh, goodbyes and some farewells and I began to make my way. Uh, the next steps to that jail was like a blur. I remember going down to outtake, which is the opposite of intake. They gave me $40 and a bus ticket, and I was waiting with about 20 to 40 guys at the facility, waiting for the facility bus to take us to the nearest city where we could catch a Greyhound or a Peter Pan to get down to our city. Mine's happened to be New York City. I remember getting off the bus and looking at the people walking around so freely, men, women, and children. Some was on cell phone, and that blew my mind because I was so used to walking in a straight, single foul line. I was like, wow! I remember the smell. It was the McDonald's and the Burger King mixed with the pollution in the air. 
I was like, yeah, I'm almost there. And I remember the guys talking about what they were going to do when they got home, some of the food that they, that they was going to eat, their loved ones they couldn't wait to see, the things that they wanted to do with their girlfriends. But I could think about none of that. The only thing I could think about was those guys that I left back in the facility, my comrades. I wonder what they were doing at this moment. What was they having for lunch? Were they still working out? Our regular scheduled workouts? You know that guy, June, that I spoke to you about? <laughs> well, he had missed, he had utilized any, any excuse to miss a workout. So I was pretty concerned about him, right? And then I thought to myself, what is wrong with me? Why I'm not having the thoughts that these guys that's being released are having. It wasn't until I got my first job as a group facilitator when I was facilitating a group full of young men and I shared this story and a young man inside that group said, that's survivor's guilt. I turned around like, facts. <laughs> but the fact is, I didn't even know what survivor's guilt was. Thank God that Google is our friend. So in that moment I learned that survivor's guilt is commonly associated with PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, is when an individual or people survive an incident that most people did not survive. And it was in that moment I began to understand those attacks that I was having. When I was giving away my stuff to my comrades, that was cool, but what I really wanted to do was be able to give them their freedom. When they took their time out to make me that meal, I was grateful, but what I really wanted to do was something like what June said, for all of us to be on the outside eating whatever that we wanted to eat. And in those last final moments when we were saying our goodbyes, what I really wanted was for them to be able to embark on that journey with me. I still get those attacks to this day. But instead of disregarding them, I utilized them to fuel the work that I do. When I work with the men and women that's formerly incarcerated and I help them navigate the barriers to successful reentry, I like to say, yes, that's what I do. When I work with those young men and women that's closely associated to gang and gun violence, helping them change their mindset, which will ultimately help them change their behaviors, I like to say, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Instead of disregarding those feelings, I utilize these feelings to help other survivors. Thank you. That was David Gaskin. David was born and raised in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. He wants you to know that's the old Bed-Stuy, not the new Bed-Stuy. David recently discovered his interest in storytelling by assisting and encouraging formerly incarcerated people to share their stories. David is a community leader working against gun and gang violence. He's also the lead consultant for Conspiring for Good, which helps organizations, corporations, and individuals to imagine, cultivate, and co-create safety inside of their communities and workspaces. If you'd like to see a photo of David's community work, you can check out themoth.org slash extras. The community education program has grown a lot since 1999. Jennifer Birmingham, the Moth's managing director of programs, tells us, in 2022, the program initiated a participant to instructor pipeline. We also held our first drop-in workshops where alumni and their families and friends come to develop stories in monthly virtual moth meetups. In 2023, we'll hold our first community story slams, where alumni will share their stories in front of live audiences. In the 14 years I've been with the moth, I've worked very closely in and with the community engagement program. And through all of this wonderful growth, What's remained consistent is the spirit, the energy, and the love that our participants and our instructors and our partners bring to the process. So here's to many more years of connecting communities and shedding light on some of our most pressing social issues through the art and craft of true personal storytelling. 
Larry Rosen is a master instructor at The Moth. After 25 years teaching, directing, and practicing theater and comedy performance, Larry discovered the simplicity, power, and beauty of true stories. Shortly thereafter, he found The Moth. As they say, timing is everything. This episode of the Moth Podcast was produced by Sarah Austin Janess, Sarah Jane Johnson, and me, Mark Sollinger. The stories in this episode were directed by Larry Rosen. The rest of the Moth's leadership team includes Sarah Haberman, Catherine Burns, Jennifer Hickson, Meg Bowles, Kate Tellers, Jennifer Birmingham, Marina Cluche, Suzanne Rust, Brandon Grant, Leanne Gully, Inga Glodowski, and Aldi Kaza. All Moth stories are true, as remembered by the storytellers. For more about our podcast, information on pitching your own story, and everything else, go to our website, themoth.org. The Moth Podcast is presented by PRX, the public radio exchange, helping make public radio more public at prx.org.